I'm Ravi Gurumurthy, I'm Chief Executive of, of Nesta. Um, and at Nesta, we try and design and test solutions to society's biggest challenges. Um, and we've got three missions, a sustainable future, a fairer start and a healthy life. And we also have with us the Behavioural Insights team in our family that works right across the world, um, running experiments to shift human behaviour. And I'm delighted that we've got Michael here. Michael is um, Professor of Economic Psychology um, at LSE and has got a number of other affiliations. And he's written a fantastic book called A Theory of Everyone. Um, I can't remember a more ambitious book that I've read in the last <laughs> few years. Uh, the, the title... A modest title. It, it, it's a modest proposal. It's a theory of everything, right? <laughs> exactly. It, it's incredibly rich. Um, it, it covers the laws of how society evolves and changes, but then applies it to particular areas that we're going to get into, ranging from democracy, social media, immigration, wealth creation, and so on. Um, so, Michael, I mean, first of all, it, it's a hell of a claim, a theory of everyone. Yeah. Just talk us through how you went about thinking, go on, I'm going to actually try to knit it all together rather than um, do what you probably do in a lot of your day job, which yeah. is probably more on the micro side. Yeah, well, I mean, so actually, um, you know, one of the bits of advice that I got in writing a book is uh, definitely don't write a book to make money. Uh, and definitely don't write a book because it feels like, you know, this is a moment in your career. Write a book because it's bursting out of you. And what was bursting out of me is this was this realization that the, the advances that we have made in our understanding of human evolution and cultural evolution, the way things uh, have changed over time, knit everything together. They, they make sense of things that otherwise seem different. So why, you know, why do uh, people in East Asia behave in this particular way? Why do different classes in society behave differently? Um, and how has this changed over time? We kind of have the laws that underlie that. And this seemed to me as profound a shift as uh, the move from alchemy to chemistry was when we discovered the periodic table or when Darwin suggested, you know, it wasn't just God doing this magical thing. There are laws by which life evolves over time. And so... That that kind of realization exists within certain spheres. So within economics, you've got you know people like uh, Nathan Nunn, for example. Within biology, uh, you've got people like Kevin Lala. You know th this realization that this can be applied across the animal kingdom and to economic systems is there, but the general public knows very little about it. Mm -hmm. And even within academia, it hasn't spread quite as far. So I, so what I really wanted to do was to say, okay, I don't want to give you study after study after study. I want to lay out that framework for you. Mm -hmm. Like I want to lay out that theory so that when you see it, hopefully you can't see it like you'll see those connections you'll see the forest for the trees um so one thing i want to say ravi is you know if, if someone you know ended up on this chair and said i have a theory of everyone you should be like mm, I, i'm a little skeptical but the claim that i'm making is that there is a theory of everyone in this field and mm -hmm. here i am trying to present it to you mm -hmm. as easily as i can now a, a lot of social scientists these days grapple with the replication crisis and yeah. whether things can be generalized mm -hmm. in some ways don't you think that's the field of social science yeah. and behavioral science has, has almost gone in the opposite direction in terms yeah. of the claims that we're trying to make. Yeah. So um, my most cited paper, and this really annoys me. My mo so I sorry, so I started my PhD in 2010. So this was the year uh, that the Weird People paper came out, but it was also uh, the year that uh, the Psy paper, you know, that humans have psychic abilities came out. And it was the year that, you know, all of this uh, replication crisis stuff started happening. And so the, the conclusion to my dissertation was turned into a paper in Nature Human Behavior called A Problem in Theory. And it was really me expressing a frustration that um, the model that behavioral science and psychology and a lot of the social sciences used was a bit more like a a medical model or a clinical model based entirely on empiricism. Mm -hmm. But that's not the way the other sciences work. It's not how biology works. It's not really how chemistry works. It's not how physics works. There, they realize that there is a limit to empiricism. What you really want is empiricism to guide you toward uh, a deeper understanding of the world that then you can make new predictions about. Mm -hmm. So one of the analogies I use in that paper is imagine uh, trying to figure out where a planet is, right? And you take a purely empirical approach and you say, I see it over there. Come on, everybody, come look. And everybody looks and says, it's not there anymore. And so you say, oh, well, it, it must have moved because the context is different. We ran the study last time. It was there. I don't understand. But then someone else says, oh, I see it. It's over here. And so people keep pointing to this and, and you're trying to empirically discover where the planet is when that's not, that's not the exercise at all. There's a limit to empiricism. What you really want is orbital mechanics. And that's hard. So the Ptolemaic model was, was predictive, but it was also false. It was based on circles and epicircles. And the Copernican model was exactly like that too. And it was only Kepler who kind of gave us this, this, this realization, first off, that um, 
it's not the it's not the sun moving around the earth but the earth and the other planets moving around the sun that's the first major shift mm -hmm. and the second is that it's an elliptical orbit not a circular orbit okay so that's what's happened in the human and social sciences that's what's happened that mm -hmm. realization and just we'll get into the theory in one second mm -hmm. but it, you know good theory tends to be testable correct falsifiable. correct absolutely would, would you say your theory is testable absolutely okay. yeah and falsifiable okay. which is the key yeah which okay. is yeah all right well let's come back at okay. maybe you can weave in um that through the conversation yeah first of all perhaps you can we can start with the actual four laws yeah and they are laws that um are linked in some way in terms of how they yeah. play out do you want to just run through each of them yeah so i was uh I was trying to find a way to describe these these basic principles that apply to human societies and all the way down to life. And what I thought is, you know, they're almost like laws. They are fundamental truths about the world. They're not laws in a kind of Newtonian sense. They're more like lenses upon which you can view the world. And therefore, and I call them the laws of life. And the four are the law of energy. So if you look, uh, if you look at what life is really doing, what life is doing is it is it is matter using energy to make more of itself. And the limit to the complexity and total biomass is the total energy falling upon the Earth. So initially, you know, life was limited. It had volcanic heat. It had gravitational energy because the moon was closer to the Earth. And that was it. And then photosynthesis comes along. And solar energy can be stored in chemical form. And this was the beginning of kind of prokaryotic life. And then this allowed for new spaces of evolution. So eukaryotic life said, hey, I'm not going to convert the, uh, the sun directly into chemical form, I'm going to eat the animals that are doing that. And onward and upward. So you get this you get this pattern where what life is doing is seeking out this energy either directly from the sun or eating the animals or eating further up the food chain. But ultimately, all animals, and we know this in biology, have an energy budget. But this is also true of human civilization. So the limits to what we can achieve are ultimately limited by excess energy. Uh, and I can say a little bit more about that, but one, one thing you can clearly see is these moments in human history, the invention of fire, the invention of agriculture, all of these are energy technologies, and the Industrial Revolution and the use of fossil fuels as ramping up everything that humans do, mm -hmm. creating eras of abundance, then followed by scarcity as everything catches up. So that's the first law, the law uh, of energy. Well, let's just stop on that one for a okay. second. I mean, yeah. uh, how I think you've got some detail on this in the book on this, which is how well correlated is... Um, wealth creation globally or innovation to energy excess energy yeah so it's very it's it's very well correlated you know for example in the last 50 years before every uh, major recession there's a kind of spike in the, in the price of energy mm -hmm. but the second law matters here too so the second law is the law of innovation which is the new innovations that allow us to do more with that energy and what i what i the analogy that i use is you can kind of think of an energy ceiling based on this excess energy and, a, and an efficiency floor created by new technologies. So, you know, if you take something like lighting, um, you know, incandescent bulbs, I think they're around 7% efficient or whatever. Have you ever heard the, um, uh, the, the, the recommendation to turn off the lights to save the environment? Any of you guys do that? Do not bother. <laughs> exactly, Dave, David's on the money. You know, it's like, absolutely do not bother. It doesn't do anything because our lights, LED lights are close to 100% efficient and the energy use is far less. So you're doing more with, with less. And, what you what you end up is this kind of space of the possible in which all activity takes place. And so the second law is innovation. The third is cooperation. We cooperate together to get more than we could get by ourselves, or we could even get in a larger group. And there's an evolutionary process that's kind of that's mapping through this. So you asked me about that correlation. So if you look at um, just about any metric of of human welfare, so longevity, you know, child survival rates, uh, size of polities, uh, any of these kinds of things everything is pretty much flat from the beginning of history as far as we can and tap it till around the industrial revolution mm -hmm. it's all flat we live in a zero sum world so all of those things you learned about in school uh, the black death renaissance scientific revolution blips they don't do anything mm -hmm. and then we hit the industrial revolution and we get we get stored sunlight in the ground so those organisms i mentioned earlier pressure cooked by millions of years into storable, usable batteries that multiply human effort as never before. Think about what you can do. You can travel across the globe in hours you can, with the right technology. You can, um, uh, building a bookshelf, use a manual screwdriver versus an electric screwdriver, anything is multiplied. And so you think this massive takeoff, everything just ratchets upward. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a key metric in the energy sciences called the energy return on investment. So it's how much energy it takes to get some amount of energy back. And it's been so high for so long that you never had to think about that ceiling. 
economics, psychology, all of these fields came about after, well after the Industrial Revolution. And so the focus was always on that efficiency floor. Like that's literally what economics is, right? How do you how do you efficiently allocate scarce resources? And you get more and more of the space as possible just by becoming more efficient. But something turned around the around in the, in the 20th century, that energy ceiling started to kind of fall in on us. So uh, in 1919, just if you look at oil discovery rates as a kind of proxy, in 1919, one barrel of oil got you another thousand barrels. Mm -hmm. By 1950, one barrel of oil got you another hundred barrels. And by 2010, one barrel of oil got you another five. Now, we still live, by the way, in a world of excess energy. We're fine. But we're feeling that kind of squeeze as things are not quite as easy or inexpensive. You know, helicopter flights, they were astonishingly cheap in the 60s and 70s. No longer, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So uh, each of these laws mm. are kind of undergoing quite huge change right now. So yeah. energy is being totally disrupted by potentially quite abundant renewable resources and potentially yeah. diffusion even. Yeah. Um, uh, corporation collective action that's also being revolutionized yeah. can you just say a little bit about how these laws are in in flux right now so uh you've got a few things going on first off uh efficiency total factor productivity has slowed down still getting more productive but it's slowed down so that means that efficiency floor is uh the rate at which it is is kind of getting better and better is slowing down and on top of that that energy ceiling is kind of falling in on us and these laws are connected to each other so the prediction that one would make from that is that the scale of our cooperation also shrinks alongside that. So it was because of that excess energy that eukaryotic life and multicellular life could emerge because by working together, by growing, they could better outcompete that other life. You saw the same thing in human society. So on the back of cheap and available coal, this country created the, the largest empire the world had ever seen, which is why you know the two of us from different parts of the world speaking English right now. And what they were doing was they were going after less cooperative, uh, less energy rich civilizations. It didn't matter what the technology that they had was, right? Um, and so the cooperation is shrinking because our, what I suspect is that our zero sum biases are being triggered. We, we have, uh, we have a, a cultural learning psychology that is ideal under conditions of positive sumness, right? So some things are always there, some like the mating competition. But if you if you start a business in a booming economy, let's say you start a coffee shop, uh, and I see your coffee shop and it's booming, in a positive sum world, I would say, hey, that's amazing. I should start a coffee shop. I should jump in. I should start the Starbucks and we can both do well. And I'm going to make better coffee than Ravi is. And then, you know, it's a virtuous, productive cycle of competition. But if my zero sum biases are triggered and I, I see that your coffee shop is booming, now I think you've taken a piece of the pie. You've taken a piece of the market that I can't get back. The pie is fixed. I can't get that back. And so now the best thing I can do is harm you in some way. Mm -hmm. And so you get instead this kind of destructive cycle. Uh, another analogy that I use in the book is if you imagine kind of the economic growth rate. So if you, if you want, so we, in, in biology, we talk about ultimate and proximate explanations. So what I've been describing so far is an ultimate explanation. But let's, let's focus on the proximate, what's happening. Imagine the economic growth rate is buses coming along. And they're coming along uh, every five minutes. Now, there are always fractures in society. People are upset because some people are the 1%. They always get to the front of the line no matter what. And some people, they're annoyed about some ethnicities or lobbying groups or you know who, who let other people in the line in front of them. They're annoyed, but it doesn't matter. You're going to get a seat. It's coming every five minutes. But now imagine the rate of buses slows down and maybe the number of people waiting at the bus stop also grows. It's one every hour. It's one every day. Those mumblings and grumblings that were always there break out into something more. And that is what we're seeing today. We're seeing a, a rise in popularism and a rise in the right wing that we haven't seen in a century in Europe. Uh, we're seeing polarization across the world, particularly in the United States. And I see these as a symptom of these kind of ultimate level phenomena. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, on, on innovation, the law of innovation, you, you talk quite a lot about um, what, what, what are the basic properties of innovation systems yeah. and therefore you know, what we can do to make um, innovation prosper. Yeah. Obviously, we spend a lot of our time thinking about that here. Yeah. Can you sort of lay out the framework that you've, you've got in the book? Sure. Yeah. So... Um, you know, I remember I said, you know, one of the major shifts for understanding orbital mechanics was this idea that the sun was in the center and, and you get these elliptical orbits. The key realization for, for human progress is that we are a product, we're a different kind of animal. We're a product not just of genetic instincts and a lifetime of experience, but culturally acquired software that we get from our societies that is itself evolving over time. And this is what we call cultural evolution. And if you look 
at innovation from the perspective of changing software, you realize that it's less about these kinds of singular geniuses who see further than others, as much as it is about individuals with who are smart enough in the right place where interconnections are uh, are, are driving ideas and recombining in our networks. You know, uh, Matt Ridley, the the biologist and writer, calls it you know ideas having sex. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, and then you can actually look at so so mysteries like why do why do uh, some innovations emerge at the same time? Simultaneous innovations are, are very common. Why is that? Well, why do Newton and Leibniz both come up with calculus? Why do uh, Wallace and Darwin both come up with evolution? They're exposed to the same material and they're smart enough to put those pieces together. So another way to say this, I guess, is that um, innovation is a computation. It's a search through spaces of possibilities. And while humans are smart, humanity is smarter. Our societies are smarter. And as we seek out who to learn from, where we might get things, sparks of ideas are, are flowing around. And so then what you start to think about is, OK, well, what are the population level differences that could increase innovation? Having smart people in the room is, is a good idea, because those smart people embody a bunch of ideas within their head, a bunch of training and a bunch of ways of thinking. But if you have 10x engineers who can't work with each other, you still got 10x engineers. If you have like 1x engineers who can work very well, you might have a 10x team. Mm -hmm. And if you have 10x engineers working together very well, you might get a 100x team. So it's about how do you, and so what are those levers? Well, what, what Joe Henrik and I identified uh, from some models as, as well as um, some empirical data is um, transmission fidelity. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, how well can you transmit information? How open of a culture do you have? Is there freedom of speech? Are ideas flowing between people freely? Or is there a good match between the problems people face and the potential solutions that other people know about? sociality. So this is the size and interconnectedness of your population. So are people exposed to the right people? Are they reading across disciplines? Um, and the final one is diversity. And diversity is a tricky one. So I call this a paradox of diversity because in the models and in empirical data, uh, diversity is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, a lot of innovation is driven by incremental improvement, you know, 99% perspiration, 1% mm -hmm. inspiration. It's driven by serendipity. You know, um, you see a uh, an agar plate, and you've got this uh, this bacteria growing on it, and it's killing the. Uh, 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 sorry, you got a mold growing on it, it's killing the bacteria. Oh, that looks like that might be penicillin. So you get serendipity, and then you have recombination. And recombination is the most powerful of these. It's intellectual arbitrage. It's taking a solution from one discipline and bringing it to another. You know, let's say. I don't know, an economist reading some psychological work and winning a Nobel Prize, that yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> Never happens, but that kind of thing could happen. Yeah. Um, diversity allows for that. It is the fuel for recombination. It's different ways of thinking coming to the table. But diversity only works in a safe and inclusive environment where those ideas can actually meet. So diversity is also divisive. Mm -hmm. Like if we didn't speak the same language, no ideas would flow between us. Mm -hmm. If we didn't have common ways of working, common values, common goals that at least created some alignment, it would be very difficult for us to work alongside each other. I mean, that sort of resonates for me in the sense that when you try and put together multidisciplinary teams, exactly. it can either be the best of things exactly. where you're getting rich insights or they can be incoherent exactly. where there isn't a shared language and um, you, you've right. got to really work hard on those common exactly. sets and language. I mean, does that exactly. make you think a bit about certain forms of diversity matter more than others? So for instance, yeah. we should emphasize viewpoint diversity more, yeah. perhaps pay less attention to more superficial characteristics. Well, that's that's almost certainly true. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people use these superficial characteristics, I think, as a proxy for what we should really care about, which is a diversity of ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, you know, um, I do two things in this sphere. So first off, the, the disciplinary diversity is a less controversial place where I think it's very obvious what's going on. The most diverse teams are both the most creative and the least creative, mm -hmm. the most effective and the least effective. It's only if, and, and it's those monocultural teams that you know are, are reliably good. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, if you're diversity and you can unlock the potential without paying the cost, then you do very well. But a lot of times it's very difficult to do. So what diversity ends up happening, how it ends up happening, is that uh, it's a kind of, it's a, it's, I don't know if you watch Family Guy, it's a Peter Griffin skin chart exercise. It's like, do we have enough women in the room to make sure that this is not an embarrassing situation? Uh, do we have enough, you know, uh, highly melanated, you know, people with dark skin in the room to make sure this isn't embarrassing? But really, when people are hiring, they're saying more of me. Like, yes, you look different. Yes, you have different chromosomes, but you, you're basically like me.
you know? And so that's not the kind of diversity we need. What we want is people with a diversity of life experience, uh, a, a diversity of ways of viewing the world, the diversity of disciplines who can also talk to each other. So at the LSE, I run a, a service line called Culturalytic, where we try to provide this for companies. But I've also lived it in the database of religious history, which to my view is one of the most successful humanities science collaborations on the planet. And it took a long time before we could, so now right now it's like an $8 million project with like hundreds of uh, historians working on it, many social scientists and so on. But it took a long time to get there. And that was because I was a scientist and I didn't understand how humanities people thought. I was like, of course you're gonna contribute your data to my system so that I can answer the big and important questions. And the historians were like, I don't believe in this scientism thing. Mm -hmm. And so we had to create an environment that was a win-win for them and you know, a win for them and a win for us, a win-win situation. And we had to sit down with each other and find that common language. We had to find where those, those are. So do some kinds of diversity matter more? Yes, different ways of viewing the world is the most important kind of diversity, the mm -hmm. kind of cognitive diversity. But in other cases, you want optimal assimilation. You have to speak the same language. Mm -hmm. You have to have common ways of working. You have to use the same software. You have to decide whether you can uh, challenge the leader or not challenge the leader, whether you're flat or whether you're more matrixed or whether you're higher. You need to make those uh, common, but you can also negotiate them. So talk quite a bit about energy. One of the laws talked about mm -hmm. innovation. Your law around cooperation. Yeah. I mean, that touches on some of your work that you've done on yeah. collective brain. Um, just right. yeah. say a little bit more about that concept and, and yeah. again, it, how it's changing. So the, the law of cooperation is that the optimal scale of cooperation is the one where the payoff per person is higher than it would be in a larger or a smaller group or a different, you know, a different group of different uh, characteristics. Mm -hmm. It's almost obvious when you, you know, when you say it's almost obvious that that's true. Now, not all groups reach. So that, let me just say, like, if I could start a company and do it all by myself, I don't need funders, I don't need employees, I'm going to keep all the equity and I could still create a unicorn company. I'm going to do it, mm -hmm. but I can't. I need other people on board. But the number of other people, the ideal number is the smallest group that lets me reliably get that prize when divided up per person is higher than I would get by taking a salary job or working in a different company. The, you know, the, the optimal size of a scientific group is exactly the same way. The optimal size of a country is the same way. The optimal size of anything is, is, is the same way. So in our models, when we, when we so let me go back a little bit. In 2005, Science Magazine laid out its top 25 scientific questions for the coming quarter century. And on that top 25 list was the puzzle of cooperation. How on earth did we end up in societies of strangers, of strangers where people from different parts of the world can be in the same room together and not be at each other's throats? And you take that for granted, but this is weird. If this was a group, if this was a room full of chimps, we'd be talking dead and maimed chimps. Chimps do not tolerate strangers. This is historically strange. Even 200 years ago, this would be an odd situation, right? And this is geographically strange because not everywhere in the world would accept this kind of situation. So how do we get there? So my answer to this is, is to do with energy, excess energy created by that, both the, uh, the, the actual fossil fuels uh, as well as uh, those technologies in this kind of evolutionary competition. But since 2005, we have identified, I would say, the mechanisms that sustain cooperation at different scales. Mm -hmm. The thing is, those scales exist at the same time. So we identified inclusive fitness and kin selection. We've known this for a long time. It's a, it's a genes that can identify and favor copies of themselves with spread at the expense of those. No, that's why every animal, like a lion comes in, it'll kill the cubs of the other lion that was there and then replace it with its own cubs. It won't kill its own cubs. Cooperation across the animal kingdom is with kin. And we were too. Direct reciprocity, you scratch my back, I scratch yours, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Indirect reciprocity, I'm not gonna hire from the best person, I'm gonna hire someone I know or know of. Institutions, which, you know, if you can get them right, that's great. Uh, and religion, it plays, you know, we, we think that it plays a role in transitioning us from reputational-based systems to institutional-based systems. But here's the problem, they're all there at the same time. So some of my work has been on corruption, which people think of as a puzzle. Corruption is not a puzzle at all. The puzzle is how you don't have corruption. Why? Because what we, when, it, when, it, when a president or a prime minister gives a job to, a, uh, to his son, that's nepotism, but it's also inclusive fitness, undermining institutional-based cooperation. If, if a manager gives a job to her friend or a friend of a friend, that's direct or indirect reciprocity, undermining our meritocracy. So you've got a new puzzle. It's not identifying the mechanisms. It's how do you get those higher mechanisms without those lower mechanisms getting in the way. Mm -hmm. There are different ways to get there. One is you live in a positive sum world where it pays to work at a higher level. 
Two is that you suppress some of those lower scales. So uh, my my uh, advisor and collaborator, Joe Henrik, you know, has this book called The Weirdest People in the World, where he argues that there, a very specific historical event happened in Europe in around the fourth century uh, where Europe bans cousin marriage and that destroys European tribes. So around the world, people often marry their cousins or close relatives and you get your uncle isn't just your uncle. He's connected to you with obligations in these big, vast webs. And that allows kin selection plus a little bit of culture to rise cooperation, but it undermines states. Mm -hmm. In Europe, we drop back to this very weird thing we call the traditional family, the nuclear family, which is anything but traditional. You're supposed to have a web, or we used to have a web of people. It drops it back to individualistic cultures. And that lays the foundations for more successful democracies and less of that kind of corruption. Now, nepotism still is there, right? Mm -hmm. Why? Be sorry, uh, cronyism is still there because direct reciprocity is still there. Mm -hmm. But again, the same principles. So if you look at the anti-corruption literature, having cooling off periods, preventing the revolving door. Mm -hmm. uh, these things undermine that ability for people to form groups that otherwise would undermine these higher scales. And, uh, and if you look at cross-national comparisons on corruption, does, exactly. does yeah. the, the, the presence of kinship-based societies yeah. or yeah. abundance and scarcity, how well correlated very. Yeah. So yeah, so the kinship intensity index, or uh, let me, let me, yeah, so yes, yeah, so it correlates very well, but I'll, I'll give you where family is super important, right? Where la familia le tuto, you know? Mm -hmm. Those are the places with the highest levels of nepotism, mm -hmm. unsurprisingly, because people often think about corruption as a problem with the leaders. They're like, why can't we get the right leaders who are less corrupt? No, it's a problem with the entire society. People have family obligations, and they ha give those obligations if they are the, the local grocery store earner. They, you know, they give some favors to their family. If they're the visa officer, they help you get to the front of the line. And if they're the, the minister, they're expected to help their family. So you have to wear a way around that. Great. Well, so we are... Yeah. Um... We're going to turn to some solutions and actual practical areas, um, but yeah. do get your questions ready both here and online, because uh, we'll we'll try and bring some of those in. Um, but you, in the book, you try to sort of explain how these different laws can play out in um, democracy and how you want to improve yeah. that, or how you improve misinformation yeah. in in social media. Um, why don't we just pick a, a few areas just to illustrate the arguments? Yeah. Let's let's take immigration. Okay. Yeah. Um, what, talk to us about how the laws play out there and then yeah. some solutions as well. So um, the first half of the book is laying out the science, if you like, showing the periodic table. Mm -hmm. And the second half says, look, you know, even before we had the periodic table, we, we had gunpowder. But we were also trying to turn lead into gold because we didn't, you know, Newton himself, bright guy, but trying to turn lead into gold because he doesn't realize that these are different elements. You can't do that without a, you know, a large hadron collider or a star or something. In the same way, part two of the book is trying to highlight either new solutions or existing solutions that are more like the gunpowder mm -hmm. and moving away from the kind of turning lead into gold. And immigration is a good example of this. Building a great society is not unlike building a great organization. And your immigration, an optimal immigration policy is like a great hiring strategy, right? You are looking to bring people into the country who will be there for their benefit so that you want if there's a limited number of migrants and you don't have open borders, you want to pick the migrants that are themselves going to do as well as possible. And as a result of that, the country is going to do as well as possible. So there's ways to do that, right? So if you are targeting industries that are in need of labor, it's not about high skill versus low skill. It's just industries in need of labor because there isn't the training there or the people aren't living in that area or there are some barriers for local populations. Then local populations are not upset when you're bringing people who are filling those needs. Mm -hmm. Just as much as if you have a great organization, you're trying to fill the positions you don't have. When people turn up, in, regardless of the numbers they turn up, and even if it's a, so companies have obligations to the public, they do a, a pro bono work or whatever. We have international obligations toward refugees, but it's a totally different situation. It's a random sampling strategy from, from countries around the world. There's nice data from Uganda, for example, that shows that when refugees come to a place and it's paired with investment in infrastructure, people welcome those refugees. Because what you're trying to avoid with um, non selective immigration is triggering zero-sum biases. Mm -hmm. So if hospitals wait times are, it's difficult to get a hold of your doctor, if the best schools are very difficult to get into, if there's not enough housing or housing is, is yeah. out of control, then you're gonna get, people are gonna be upset if the new people who come in are given all these things or there's just more people and they're not making as large contributions. 
there's some there's some really difficult truths around the paradox of diversity here, right? So we can we can look at the characteristics of different migrants and the at least the fiscal contribution that they're making. And money isn't everything, the economy isn't everything. But you can look at the fiscal contribution and it varies considerably. Which means in a social welfare state, some migrants are making a greater contribution and others are a net loss, at least in the first generation. We don't know exactly what happens in, in subsequent generations. That's fine, and it's, an, it's, a, it's a policy decision to be made. That might be totally okay, but it does undermine the social welfare state because the welfare state relies on uh, highly productive members of society being there for the lowest members of society. And I want to be very clear. This isn't like a race to the top where we only focus on the top, right? I, I truly believe that our society uh, ought to be judged not just by our top end or middle, but also our bottom, right? Um, do you know that quote by uh, allegedly the anthropologist Margaret Mead? She probably didn't say right. this, but she said, the sign of a civilization is a broken bone. Mm -hmm. Because in the animal kingdom, a broken bone is that's it, game over. But if you have a healed broken bone, it means the people were there for you. Mm -hmm. they, they brought you food. They looked after you during a time when you couldn't look after yourself. So yeah, there's a compassionate element to this, but there's a pragmatic element to it as well. I, and, and you also talk about different forms of, of multiculturalism in mm. the book, the sort of no hyphen model, the yeah. melting pot. You've yeah. got a new term called the the, the umbrella That's right, model yeah. of multiculturalism. Just explain that briefly. Do you want the umbrella model or just like go through the models? Go, uh, go, go through the models and explain. Yeah. yeah. So, so the, uh, in the in the um, in the diversity at multiculturalism literature, there are kind of three models. I give them new names. Some of them are, are old names. So, one model you might be familiar with is the is the melting pot model. This is uh, uh, the United States kind of model. The idea is that everybody comes in and you you, you have this big pot and you mix them all in and you create a new stew, a new culture uh, where the ingredients are no longer quite clear. And that that can work, but uh, as Terry Pratchett, he has this fictional world. More pork, he says, uh, the melting pot is wonderful, except for the pieces that don't quite melt. Mm -hmm. There's that. And also, you know, some ingredients are going to be more dominant than others. You might have a very, you know, particular ingredient or something. Uh, so that's great if it can work. Mm -hmm. The other models uh, are the what's called the salad bowl model or the mosaic model. Mm -hmm. This is most notably associated with Canada. So the idea is... Are they that, always food-based? I don't know. I don't know. The, at least the mosaic is it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's go with that. Um, yeah, so the mosaic model is the idea is that uh, it's like a it's like a beautiful mosaic made up of different panes of glass, mm -hmm. and those panes of glass are not expected to assimilate or anything like that. They're just communities, but they come together. Mm -hmm. But from from our theories, we suggest that really only works under under well resourced situation because those are the cracks. Or to say it another way, uh, a mosaic is great and can be quite beautiful, but it isn't going to resist pressure in the same way that a single pane of glass would. The single pane of glass model is what's called the no hyphen model. Um, so this, I, I, I France, put, basically. this is this is France. Yeah, it's basically you know Gerard Orad. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing his name. I almost certainly am. Got into a fight with Trevor Noah. You know the Daily Show's comedian. Normally, uh, ambassadors to the United States don't get into fights with comedians, but he got really upset. Trevor said, um, "So uh, France won the World Cup, and several of the players were of African descent." And he said, "Africa won the World Cup." And Gerard said, I reject that. That is white supremacist talking. You know, but I, I should say Trevor was like, you didn't get that tan of the south of France. I love it. <laughs> you know, and, and, and Gerard is like, no, there is only French. We are not American. We don't do, you know, African-American, Asian-American. We don't do that. There's just French. There's no Muslim American. There's uh, sorry. There's no Muslim French. There's no, you know, Arabic French. There's just French. And all of those are a, an individual reality. Mm -hmm. It's a nice sentiment, but in, in practice, it doesn't work that way, mm -hmm. right? You ha in order for that to work, you have to have people who are willing and wanting to assimilate. You can't force these things. And uh, you, you have to have a culture that embraces people into the, the French fold. And, and, and at some level, they do. But on the other hand, France has a history, a colonial history, where they've actively tried to suppress elements of culture on the back of that no hyphen model. Nice idea, very difficult to achieve in practice. The model that I advocate for based on you know, the, the, this kind of theory of everyone is what I call the umbrella model. And it's built on, you know, I, I think of it as an umbrella corporation or a literal umbrella. And the idea is that it's really about resources. And it's about ensuring that everyone under that umbrella has something to do to hold that umbrella up. Right. So it is about building a great organization. It's about what is your hiring strategy look like? How do you ensure that economic growth continues so that everyone in this population is well looked after? That there's a good match between opportunity and talent. Right. You're 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 making sure that there's a there's a reasonably level playing field so that every generation we're picking the best people to push forward humanity. And you're not getting this kind of entrenched situation where some people are limited by the happenstance of their birth. Mm -hmm. So that's the situation. There's a there's a there's a great there's a 
that's what all I wanted to say. But I want to add a little anecdote about this. So in um, in the United States, if you look at heritability, mm -hmm. uh, the heritability uh, uh, of IQ and educational attainment is higher among the wealthy than it is among the poor. And there's a whole section about what heritability actually means, and that might be confusing if you don't understand that, but heritability is how well uh, the, the phenotype, the outcome, is predicted by the genetic variation. And it's very well predicted in the, in, the, in the rich and not very well predicted in the poor. Why? Because in the United States, there is not a huge difference between elite school A and elite school B. But if you are poor, there is a literal sometimes school lottery that determines the neighborhood you live in or the school that you go to that can vastly affect your life outcomes. In other words, your genes have, have much less to do with it than these kind of uh, environmental variations. You don't quite see that in a lot of Europe. You don't see that in Australia. So there is a bit more, at least educationally, a bit more of a level playing field. But the more level that is, the more there is this kind of opportunity for all that variation, each generation to be picked. And I go through a variety of strategies to help create that situation. Great. I'm going to pick on a couple more uh, examples, and then we'll throw to questions. One is startup cities. Ah, yes. Yeah. Can you explain what start. They sound yeah. like... So one of the tech bro cities, it does. I, I made fun of myself in there. So I don't okay. mind, you know, that sounds like a tech bro solution. Um, one of the challenges that I go through in the book is governance in the 21st century. One thing to say, we live in a world that we did not create. Uh, we live in a world that we just inherited, right? And we accept the world as it is. Like you accept that you had to go to school, that you had to work at a company, that you got a job, you got to pay taxes, you accept all this stuff. You didn't create it, nor did our parents, nor did our grandparents, right? Um, and another thing we accept is nation states, borders, and all these kinds of things. They're all constructs that we've, that we've accepted. But the, the fact is the world was created by people no smarter than the people in this room, and actually not quite as smart because of the rise in education and so on. Okay. Nation states were built for a different kind of world, and they we can see that democracy and the way that we govern ourselves is struggling in a more diverse world where social media and the internet has created fractures with people with different information. I, I talk about how the internet has created new tribes. So people who were had small interests or whatever can find it QAnon, uh, any group of any kind, you know, rare medical conditions, can create new tribes and advocate for those tribes. So you've got this problem. The solution isn't greater centralization. I argue the solution is greater decentralization, where we do have a model that has worked really well for governance and that allows for rapid change and doesn't have the kind of characteristics of autocrats that where everything is quite centralized, right? Mm -hmm. And you can go, you can you can move forward very quickly the way China does, but also move forward in the wrong direction, which is very common if you're no longer at the, the uh, if you're at the forefront of uh, uh, of technology rather than trying to catch up. And that is cities, charter cities. Uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, Shenzhen. Hong Kong in particular. So Hong Kong was a, was a fishing village, about 8,000 people when the Brits turn up. Today, if you measure them culturally, they are 50% British and 50% Chinese, and that is the source of the conflict that you're seeing there today. Hong Kong was incredibly successful on, on, on many human uh, development indices. It is right there at the top. And it did that. And when it was handed back to China, it served as an engine of development. And China saw that and said, we want to do more of that. And so they created special economic zones. And then they thought through Belt and Road, let's try to do that around the world. But China does it in a very specific way. They build their cities and they bring their people and they remain kind of Chinese cities. There's no reason that China should be the only group trying to do this. So I'm a fellow at the Charter Cities Institute, where right now new cities are being created by charter. So remember, one of the problems is corruption and it's entrenched. But if you can convince a government to give off a piece of unused land, you can encourage foreign direct investment. You can guarantee that for 99 years, we're gonna control this piece of land. So that's a long time horizon. People buy leaseholds, right? So it's a nice, it's a long, it's a long amount of time for someone to hold this. You can invest in it, you can build it up, and when it's finished, you hand it back. And it can serve as an engine of development for those countries. So I, I, they're sometimes called charter cities. I prefer the term startup cities because it acknowledges that it's like a startup. It's not just about institutions, it's also about culture. It's about building things with people. It's about a diversity and there can be failure mm -hmm. because Silicon Valley, you know, probably one of the, the, the most, uh, the, the richest startup environments in the world is not a bastion of success. Yep. It is a graveyard of failure. Most of those companies there you've never heard of and failed, but the successes, everybody learns from them and over time you get better. So all of those unicorns are called unicorns because they're so rare, but you have to accept that tolerance for failure. It's part of the innovation process. And just finally, um... I mean, you touched on it earlier, um, 
the internet, the future of the internet, yeah. social media, and the rise of misinformation. It's something that a lot of people in the yeah. Global Insights team have, have, have thought about and done work on. Um, could you say a bit about that, but, but also particularly how yeah. it relates to your four laws? Because I'm trying to yeah. find the connection between the yeah the theory and the kind of specific examples. Yeah, so, you know, the... the I, I probably could have done a better job in making that much more explicit. You know, it's in your head, it's really yeah. obvious to you, and you, you try, but you have theory of mind failures. Uh, so, you know, for example, cooperation is where the uh, a lot of the immigration stuff comes from. Um, it's the innovation that's driving some of the thoughts around the internet, right? Mm -hmm. Those population level processes that allow for greater innovation. The internet has sped up cultural evolution, and we are dealing with the aftermath of that rapid feedback loop on a lot of things. So, you know, we talk about misinformation. And it's true that, you know, in the US, they talk about the Walter Cronkite effect. So everybody got the news from Walter Cronkite. And, you know, then the next day they talked about what Walter Cronkite said. Now there's many Walter Cronkites. And there's also like websites that look like news sites and people still believe them, right? Um, the internet has created these diverse sources of information that people are trying to, uh, people can, if they choose to form different groups around. But it's also exposed us to a diversity of information. When we were young, there was lots of misinformation flowing around, and the feedback loop was slower. Did you ever believe the carrots allowed you to see in the dark? I did, like a fool. <laughs> yeah. But it wasn't true, and it took decades before we realized it, right? On the internet. So I, I had a friend in, in, uh, in engineering school, and he, one day he said to me, he's like, hey, you know how when you post things on Stack Overflow, it's this website for Q&A for, uh, for programmers? Uh, no one ever answers. He's like, you know what you got to do? He's like, well, I was like, what? He's like, I have a different account. I first I post my question, and then with a different account, I post the wrong answer. And then everybody floods in because <laughs> someone is wrong on the internet. I need to fix that. That's what on the internet we see misinformation, but we also see attempts to correct it. And it's true, you know, what is it? What do they say? A lie flies across the world more quickly than you know the truth can get its pants on. Yeah, boots. It boots on. <laughs> <laughs> pants mean something different in this country. I should yeah. Boots on, definitely boots. Um, you know, before they, and that's true, that's true. But I think how we address it, so the answer to, in my view, the answer to misinformation is more information, mm -hmm. is more context, rather than, you know, misinformation tribunals or people trying to say you are the authority of truth. The fact is, the world is complicated. We don't know what the right answer is. And today's truths are tomorrow's falsehoods. And we need space to allow that. Uh, you know, John Stuart Mill, he said, we need to leave room for the uncustomary to know that one day, what of that uncustomary will one day become custom? Mm -hmm. And so freedom of speech is, is at, in my view, the most essential of this. You know, I heard uh, Ursula uh, uh, talk about this. It was on, uh, this morning I, I saw this, you know, where she was like, we need a global attempt to tackle misinformation and polarization. And the attempt there is anti-hate speech laws or the attempt to use this to kind of quash things we think. And that's a reification of what the majority believe, what we already believe. We don't know in most cases. Things change over time, mm -hmm. and it's and we and and in the same way that innovation requires a tolerance of failure, it requires people in the population to be wrong. And it's just about what percentage you're willing to accept, how quickly, and what are your mechanisms for trying to convey truth. And the biggest part of that isn't it, information and misinformation are never about information. From our theories, we can say they're about cultural transmission, which is ultimately reliant on trust. Mm -hmm. You believe all kinds of things without access to the evidence. You believe that we live on, uh, you believe that it's germs making us sick and not spirits, right? You've never seen a germ. You could, you, I don't even know if you could describe what it is, you know? Um, don't mind me. <laughs> you know, you believe that we live on a spheroid rotating around a star, one of many stars in the Milky Way, one of many galaxies in the universe. Look around you, man. The earth is flat and there's a, you know, obviously it's not flat, just to be clear, but um, it looks like the earth is flat and it looks like the sun is tracing the sky from east to west, but you will swear up and down in defiance of you, what your eyes show you because you trust that most people are right, the smartest people you know are right, you trust. And so why misinformation is flowing isn't about the information, it's about the breakdown in trust that we have with our institutions and in one another. And the answer to that is not to try to quash that, to say, no, we are right, why won't you listen to us? That's just a further breakdown in trust, mm -hmm. you have to rebuild that. Right, okay, I could talk about that for a long time but i'll resist the temptation let's go to the floor and just see if we've got um any questions here or online uh we might take a sort of couple um at a time if that's okay um anyone want to come in yes hi hi i don't know how this works honestly just introduce myself i just asked my question just go for that just go for it <laughs> 
Um, my name is Catherine. I, um, I'm doing my PhD research uh, at the University of Sussex at IES. Um, I've done some work with uh, BIT in Nigeria addressing corruption. And so when you talked about corruption, that was like the first thing that came to mind. Yeah. Because, um, you sort of touched on a theory that I have always wanted that the problem of corruption in Nigeria is the leadership and not the people. Um, and so when you talk about it, I don't know if you spoke about it in relation to the law co um, cooperation yeah. or something else because- It was it's, it's with the law of cooperation, yes. Yeah. I'm just wondering, um, in terms of the law of cooperation and yeah. you know, part of that theory of leadership that we have always talked about is you know, that um, yeah. sense of the elite consensus mm -hmm. in saying to preserve our own selves, we're going to make the system yeah. work. Yeah. So that we preserve our own self and so we yeah. create an incentive for ourselves, you know, to get things working well. Yeah. But there is no incentive right now yeah. to get things working well. And so the system is incentivizes corruption. Yeah. And so getting that cooperation from the top is not happening. Yeah. Which I feel in my own theory that it's easier to do than to get the people to cooperate. Say we're not going to be corrupt or to fight the leaders who are the people who have the power to make the change happen. Yeah. And so for me, it's a bit like it's a paradox. It's a bit confusing for me yeah. in terms of because that is what I'm researching on. Yeah. Using behavioral science and yeah, yeah. science to understand. Yeah. And I'm, I'm addressing corruption. Totally. Yeah. So what What do you have to say? Yeah, lots, lots of things, and maybe we could, you know, we could talk about it after. I mean, I don't need to say this with BIT in the room, but behavioral change, and certainly cultural change, is hard, really hard. I mean, leaders have the ability to make change in different ways. One is under conditions where there are norms, like the rule of law matters. We will be ruled by principles and not people, laws and not lords. You know, when that is there, it means that some of the, having the right institutions and binding people to those norms gives leaders a lot of power to make change. And so then you're looking and you're trying to selectively amplify the kinds of leaders that can do that. But you also need to recognize that it's not just the leaders. It is a, a cultural problem. And so the, the second thing that leaders can do is act as a way to change those norms, as, as a way to say, this is how we're going to behave. But we have to acknowledge that this is in each of us. The problem is in each of us. There's some fascinating papers out in Nigeria uh, called Cuckonomics. I don't know if you've heard this. It's like crazy economics. And it's just, you know, it's norms around the acceptance of low value and the expectation of low payment for low value. It's like you be, you're, you're trapped in a suboptimal equilibrium and you're trying to break out of that. And so then you're looking for what are the levers that allow you to. So leaders might be, selectively amplifying leaders, a small group of people. So it's not one person, it's a small group of people working together has always been how change has taken place. You know, the beverage report, the, Fabian, the Fabians in this country, you know, creating a social welfare state. Well-resourced group like that, a small group can do that. But the other option is to give that small group its own autonomy. And this is why I suggest the idea of like charter cities. And I think there are attempts to do this in, uh, in, in Nigeria as well, right? So um, one person whose work I, I greatly admire and I'm, I'm trying to work with them is, is Leonard Wanchikin. Do you know who that is? So he's a uh, he's an economist at Princeton. He's uh, he's from Benin, although he, he likes to say his grandparents were from Nigeria, you know. And so he uh, he he he's trying to create what's called the African School of Economics, um, with campuses in uh, in Lagos, in in Benin, uh, in Tanzania, and, and all around. He's got these kind of satellite communities, and they are building around that kind of these startup cities, if you like. So it's an attempt. To, so what is education? Education is a cultural download. And so it's an, it's an, it's a, it's a one of the means by which we can disrupt culture. If you get at youth and you get in the right mind, that's one way. But the other thing, of course, is the culture is responding to the environment. So sometimes you get psychological traps. So you, because you believe that you were in a zero sum situation, you try to harm other people and then they harm you back and now you're trapped. But in other cases, it is, sorry, in some cases it is just, it's just a psychological trap. And the reality is we could get out of this if we all work together. In other cases, there's a true reality to it. And the right move isn't this kind of high scale cooperation. It is a kind of more lower scale cooperation, maybe at a region trying to repair itself rather than trying to repair the country or a city trying to repair itself. And then from those cities, you get learnings going elsewhere. So another person's work you're probably familiar with is Raj Chetty and Opportunity Insights. So Raj is really looking across the United States at which cities are working well and why. And could others learn from them? The bigger principle, though, you know, drawing on the book is where, what are the levers available to me? And what are my assumptions about what's driving this? Because the reality is it's not leaders. It's the entire culture.
Great, thank you. Let's go online and then we'll come back to a question in the room as well. Sure, yeah, I've got a question from Duncan. He says, what do you see as the future challenges to your observed theories, for example, AI? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, AI is, I, I tried to, I had a longer chapter on AI, and then I took it out because it was the most uncertain that I was about it. Um, there can be these kinds of very quick and sudden shifts that really might change everything. So the way I think about AI from this perspective is that, so humans have three lines of information that guide our behavior. So if you're trying to analyze a behavior, you're thinking through genes. So the fact that we're humans and we have certain uh instincts and we have certain ways of cooperating and certain desires and so on a lifetime of experience so each of us has a different life experience and that shapes our time horizons it changed it shapes our risk preferences right and you can measure those things and then there's culture and culture isn't a homogenous whole it there's many layers to it within a society but they're lines of information and they are in some sense reinforcement learning systems the individual, I can touch a hot stove and I can learn that as an individual. As a culture, certain norms persist because, you know, people are going into certain occupations and it was paid well and now it's not. So people change, you know, those norms change over time. Again, it's a reinforcement learning system with a different lag and a different delay. Genes are the longest lag and delay. It takes a very long time before genes are adapted. Now, machine learning is, and AI is very interesting because it's a very rapid system that's looking across our culture our, our, our cultural uh, vast trove of knowledge and trying to seek out patterns that we may not see. How does it interact with the other systems? We, we're trying to figure that out. And, you know, we, we know that it, it, it's going to raise the average. We can already see that happening with people having access to it in the same way that you know having a calculator in a, your pocket or the access to the world's information did. But it might also enhance the top end as we learn to use it better. And I can't say in advance what's going on. I should say the kind of theories that I think we will ever achieve in the human and behavioral and the human and social sciences as a whole are at the level that biology has. So physicists, my brother is a physicist, right? And uh, I joke with him, your science is easy, right? Your, your planets don't decide to do weird things. Like it, you, you know what's going to happen. In the biological world, it isn't like that. If you're an ecologist and you're trying to understand an ecology, you have to measure the energy flows, the carbon pathways, the water, how many squirrels, how many foxes, and so on. But if you try to do that without the rules of evolutionary biology, you're running blind. What the book is offering is the rules of evolutionary biology, but it's hard to then predict the trajectory of species. But you're doing much better than if you're doing it based on your own life experience, which is, of course, weird and a small subset of humanity as a whole through time and, and space. Great point. Another question in the room? Yeah. 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 You know, when people are blind to it because of that bias. Yeah. So this, you know, this goes back to the, the question earlier. It, it, it's an empirical question, which one is true, right? So in some cases, there might be a structural problem. Like if if houses are difficult to afford and jobs are, are difficult to acquire, families will be delayed and you'll have fewer children and, and whatever. That's that's true. It's just a reality. If the economy slows down, you'll have fewer divorces. People don't leave. You know, th these are structural factors. But then your culture or your experience can lead you to have beliefs that cause you to behave in certain ways. Um, one of the things I work on is evil eye beliefs. So this is the idea that other people's envy can harm you. We think that that's an adaptation to zero-sum conditions. And when people come from places, so why? Because in a world of zero-sumness, other people really do want to harm you, and they won't do it to your face. They'll do it surreptitiously. It feels like magic in the power of the mind. It's not really. And so you try to, what, what does that cause you to do? You don't advertise your status. You reduce your conspicuous consumption. It's non-adaptive in, in some sense. But you're trying to find that middle ground between having high status, but not so much that people want to take stuff away from you. Now, if people come with those ideas to new places, they might behave in ways. So they might, for example, support their family, even in an environment where they shouldn't or don't need to do that. Our institutions rest on invisible cultural norms that we never think about until you get a different norm. So people pay their taxes in Scandinavia, not necessarily because their tax authorities have enough power to punish people. It's just that everybody pays their taxes, so you never think about it. 
Or if you go back to the United States, one of the, the best predictors of using tax loopholes is not whether it would benefit you, it's whether you know other people who are doing it. Because I don't know if His Majesty's Revenue and Customs could come after me. I don't know if the IRS can come after me, but if I find other people getting away with it, and that's the normative side of it. So if you get people coming in and they're building communities and those communities are supporting one another, they can undermine institutions. So the, the, there is no one answer to that. It's just a framework for you should be looking at both. Yeah. Great. Um, I've got one final question, which is um, a lot of people at the Behavioral Insights team are thinking about how the field of behavioral science evolves. Yeah. Uh, Michael Hallsworth um, put out a, a manifesto for the future of behavioral science. Good. Good manifesto. Um, and, you know, obviously that draws on different disciplines. Yeah. It looks at different ways of evaluation. Um, it thinks more about group processes rather than a sort of methodological individualism. Can you just give us your take um, on this and, and particularly thinking about providing advice to practitioners of yeah. behavioral science? Yeah, um, so I gave Michael a bunch of feedback on that and you know it reflects it cites some of this work. So I, I really like it. I think it it reflects a whole gamut of things. The only piece that I would say was underemphasized or was missing. Um so I'll just go through some of the things I think were really good. Uh thinking about the cross-cultural elements here, thinking about the within society elements, you know, doing those kinds of measurements. The only thing I think is is missing is that kind of theoretical side, mm -hmm. which is deriving predictions not just from empirics, like the planet was here, therefore it's gonna be there again. Uh, but what are the, how are people writing their cultural software? Whom do they trust? Where are they getting their information from? Where are the insertion points for trying to change behavior? I don't see as much of that. I don't see that integration of that kind of cult cultural evolutionary theory. Mm -hmm. But we know, you know, from the little bits of evidence that it, it, it does work, right? So there's, um, uh, Chandra Sekhar has this paper on, um, uh, on the use of eigenvector centrality. Uh -huh. as an insertion point in Indian villages for sending information about microfinance and loans and insurance. Why? Because micro uh, eigenvector centrality, which is you know your connectedness by the other connectedness by the other connected, same way Google works, is a measure of prestige from the evolutionary literature. And they happen to hap happenstance upon that. But you could have predicted that in advance, right? The, the work uh -huh. uh, came before that particular empir empirical finding. Um, in In... You know, when we talk about like gene editing or something, you know, CRISPR, uh, we talk about gene complexes. So no gene acts alone. It's part of a bigger web. We have cultural complexes. So people avoid uh, pineapples during pregnancy in some parts of the world, even though it's a, it's a highly nutritious food and they should be eating it. Because why? Their grandmothers say so. They have low trust in, in medical authorities, whatever. So what does that mean? Well, it means that you might want to, you, you can't just keep hammering on the grandmothers or sending them SMSs. You, sorry, you can't keep hammering on the medical uh, side or, or sending them SMSs. You should be talking to the grandparents. Mm -hmm. They should be talking about what are those barriers, trying to convince them. Uh, you know, uh, my, my, my colleague Charles Efferson has worked uh, thinking about female genital cutting, where he says, you know, we often target the groups that are um, most likely to change because they're the easy, but that can polarize a community. Mm -hmm. So there's this old uh, work uh, on female genital cutting in, from Kenya uh, in the 20th century where the attempt to stop female genital cutting increased rates because it became associated with being westernized. And if you cut your girls, you were truly Kenyan. That can, if, if you target the people who are not quite in the community anyway and who, who mostly want to change, you can you polarize it. Whereas if you target, if you manage to change, and you might not be able to, so you have to find out, but if you manage to change the central members of the community who are most in favor of FGC, then you might have an endogenous spillover where change takes care of itself. These are just examples of thinking about how the theory, right, that's a theoretical model, you know, how the theory can interface with the empirics and make sense of it and help you discern what's the lead into gold and what's the, you know, the gunpowder. Fantastic, Michael. Um, I think, as you can probably tell from that conversation, yeah. your book is incredibly rich, rich wide ranging yeah, um, well. and, and, and a real treasure trove for, for, for people here and I hope more widely. So thank you very much. Thank for you, Ravi. I really, uh, yeah, book. And, it was um, a great interview. Thank you. And, <laughs> um, and, and best of luck in your future research. Thank you. Thanks thank so you much. <laughs>